Okay. Good morning again, everyone. Um, welcome to our second, well, third and fourth lessons for the day. I'm going to put maths and science on the one video today. Um, the maths that we're doing today is mental maths, so I'll just explain that to you. A little bit of a change and fractions. So if you can head up your book for today, uh, Wednesday, 4th of August, 2021, and we're doing mental maths. Um, so I gave you a set of um, mental maths questions that basically were the four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, and everyone seemed to really like that. And you were only really supposed to do one column. And a lot of people ended up doing all three and saying that it was really good practice. Then yesterday I put on um, one minute mental maths, which looked like this. And once again, we were sort of going to do um, one and two and then three and four today and then five on Friday and everyone's gone ahead and done the whole thing and said, yep, we really like that Could we have more. So what I've done is on Teams, when you go into there, go into the Maths tab and I've just downloaded the whole resource. So it's actually a really good resource if anyone wants to download and keep that. So go in, make sure you download it. Okay, so the Maths Minute, what I think we should probably do is a lot of people have done one to five straight up. So really easy. Now, keeping in mind that's a progression thing. So as you go along, it does get a little bit harder, but it's still fine. Nothing like the book we're doing at school. So the Maths Mental book looks like this. The Minutes book, it's book G. Just get my face out of the corner and reduce that a little bit. So you just flick through it. I've just downloaded the whole book. It's got teacher's notes in there and minute recordings if you really want to take it seriously. It tells you what the topics is. It's also, this is the really cool part, it's got um, a couple of pages on the main things. So what a prime number is, the place value of things. If you go over and have a look at this, um, it's really going to top up with your foundation knowledge of maths. It's got the different symbols of maths, um, a reference for greater and less than if you get stuck on that, how fractions are made up. You can see it comes from one whole and how it's broken down, describes a fraction, um, fractions as decimals and percentages which we'll be getting to, weight, just lots and lots of really really useful information. Then it gets on to the minute maths. So we've done one, two, three, four, and five, and it looks like you guys have done that really, really easily. So if you haven't done that, please catch that up. Today is um, minute six with 10 questions, and then minute seven. Okay, so what you can do is go through and work on these. Um, I think some people have even done this one. Um, and if you're not sure about what you're looking at, you can always go back to the keywords and look it up. To build a school, it might take which one, days, weeks or years. Which angle of the shape is an obtuse angle? An obtuse angle being greater than 90 degrees. Man, when you name an angle, guys, it's just not the one in the corner. It's the whole angle. It's the rays of the angle as well. So if I was going to name a right angle, I would go A, D and C. Okay, which of the following is equal to a half? Right as a decimal, 23 hundredths. We do that all the time at school. A little word problem there. So go through, do that one, and seven. Now, when you've done that, and this is where being um, a really honest and independent learner is going to really help you, if you go through and you do that and you want to check your answers, they are on the back, the very, very last page. So you can go through and have a look. Um, and check your answers. But remember, you've got the key ideas at the front that you can check. Have a go, um, minute six and seven for today, and then check your answers, send them in to me. Get them wrong, it's a good indication for me of the things that you don't know, so please don't change them. You can write the next answer, the right answer next to it, and definitely message me if you don't understand and I'll explain it. The other book that I've attached as well, 
is on Teams. You can see them sitting next to each other. The Minutes G book, and this is the Mental Maths E book timed calculations. And when you download that copy, I'm not going to do it now because it will take too long. It looks like this. Now, this book is different in that it is just your four operations and it's really good because it asks um, questions in different ways and um, it gets you used to reading questions written in different formats. So I uploaded these three sets and they were just done by so many people. So if you haven't done these three sets, go in, download it from Teams and complete that. You can do the problems to ponder if you want to. You don't have to. That's if you want to test yourself a little bit. Now, there's three. What the, why this book is so great for teachers is because there's three different ways you can set it up. This is the way I like. It's nice and organised and boxed. But you can also pick this way. That's got the answers on it. Um, so now we're up to set four, five, and six. So I would like you to do set four and set five today. And they're, they're pretty straightforward. You don't have to time yourself. Just go through, write down one, write the question, write the answer. So just two sets today. If you really want to keep steaming ahead, you can. Just keep sending me your work. Make sure, please, that I can't mark it if I can't read it. So write your answers nicely. It's good practice for you. Think like a mathematician, write like a mathematician. It'll get you ready for high school and put your answers. Is For ones that you don't know, just put a question mark. Okay, and um, I'll mark those and send them back. Okay, now the main focus is uh, for the, our maths at the moment is fractions and we're working on comparing fractions. This is also in the maths tab. And if you haven't got it yet, go up to Term 3 Student Workbook and download that. And that's the page that I'm on at the moment. So the front page of that, we all know it. We worked on it. We did integers before we had the lockdown. Looks like this. It's got a picture of the guy who came up with Cartesian coordinates and a list of all the things you're learning. So if you can, if you haven't done the pages from yesterday, catch them up. They're pretty important. But just flick through to this page. Now, you can work from my screen. You don't even have to download it. So yesterday we talked about ordering fractions and looking at the denominator. And when we've got the same denominator, we look at the numerator because that's going to tell us how many parts of the whole there are. Okay, when we're looking at the denominator, the smaller the bottom number means the less slices in the pie. So if we are going to put these from smallest to biggest, what we are going to look at first of all is the bigger number. So these are the, this is the bigger fraction, these three here. So which one has the smallest numerator? Two twelfths. So we're going to put this, let's count the lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, well, that's handy. So this whole number here is made up of, if we were going to write this whole number as a fraction, we would write it as... 12 over 12. So 2 twelfths goes here, 1, 2, so we write 2 twelfths here. So if you can draw this number line in your book after you write fractions, and I want you to put the rest of the numbers on the line, so just pause while you do that. Okay, so 2 twelfths go here. Now half of that fraction, what's half of 12? Six, so we'll count it along. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the half is there. Then ten twelfths, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten twelfths, and then nine twelfths go here. So it looked really tricky at the beginning, but when you count them and you work out how many parts make up the whole and then break the fractions down, it is easy. Okay, now this is something we've really been concentrating in class quite a lot. And this is if we're asked to find a fraction of a whole number. Remember, when we are asked to find one-eighth of 64, what we're actually saying 
denominator, sorry, denominator always means divide. So we're actually saying 64 divided by 8. That's actually what we're saying. I write that down in the book and then write down the answer to that. Then you can pause, you can Google a um, times table, or you might even have one at home. So, of course, same thing again, 1 6 of 392. Of course, that means 392 divided by 6. And I'd like you to write that down in the book so that I can see that you're really understanding that. And one third of 399 means 399 divided by 3. So the bottom number, the denominator, and you remember it, denominator means divide. Now let's just say, and this is for the people who really understand this, that our fraction is not just a one third of 399, but a, I'll make this screen a little bigger, this is just the next step for those people who want to think about this. Let's say it's two-thirds of 399. So this bottom number means divide, and the opposite of divide is times. So you go 399 divided by 3. And that's really easy to work out because we go 3 into 3 is 1, 3 into 9 is 3, 3 into 9 is 3. So then what we've got to do is divide by 2. So 133, sorry, multiplied by 2. 2 3 is a 6, 2 3 is a 6, 2 1 is a 2. So 2 thirds of 399 is 266. So the bottom number is divide and the top number is multiply. But at this stage, the most important thing is for all these fractions with 1 8, 1 6, 1 3rd, or 1 14th, you divide by the bottom number. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're moving on and we're looking at fractions as a word problem. Now there's a couple of typos here, so bear with me. Okay, his friends ate one quarter of a meat lover's pizza. So when we look at these pizzas, how many parts are there to them? And of course the answer is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So they're all sliced up into 8 parts. So his friend ate 1 quarter of a meat lover's pizza. So 1 quarter of this is that whole 90 degree angle there, that right angle, all coloured in. Okay? Then he ate, now this is meant to be 3 quarters of a cheese lover's pizza. So three quarters is one quarter, two quarters, three quarters. So we've got one quarter here and three quarters here. Then he ate two eighths of a pepperoni pizza. So two eighths is two of those colored in. And he ate one eighth of a chicken and bacon. Now what do we know if we have one quarter and we add three quarters? That becomes a whole, doesn't it? So let's write that down, So, because this is how we'd write it down if we were doing it as an assessment. Okay, so we've got three quarters plus one quarter, and that equals four over four. And what do we know about that when the denominator is the same as the numerator? It equals one. Then we've got two eighths plus... 1 eighth, and that equals 3 eighths. So if we then add 1 plus 3 eighths, we've got 1 and 3 eighths. So that's with a word problem, that's how you work it out. You just colour in each bit as it's telling you, work out which parts go together to make a whole, and then add on the rest of the fractions. Now what we're going to do is plot this, we're going to use the number line to show how much pizza was eaten all together and we know that the answer is 1 and 3 eighths. So we go 1, but as we saw with the other problem, how many parts are there to this whole? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, easy. So 1 and 3 eighths, we go 1, 2, 3, and then we mark that, put a line down, and mark it 1 and 3 eighths. Now, we're going to write our answer as a fraction, an improper fraction, and a mixed number. That should be and a mixed number because we're going to practice 
converting them back and forth. Okay, so 1 and 3 eighths, that's a mixed number already, and that's our answer, so that's the first one. Now we're going to convert that to an improper fraction, and what we do is we go 8 times 1 plus 3, so 8 times 1 is 8, plus 3, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oops. Eight times one, eight plus three, eight, nine, ten, eleven over eight. That's an improper fraction. So we've got a mixed fraction and an improper fraction. So we've done all of those. Okay, the next one is subtraction with a fraction. Now this is pretty simple. So when we are subtracting fractions, if the bottom denominator is the same, easy. Okay, so three-fifths take away one-fifth. We leave the denominator as the same and we just go three take away one is two. So let's do the first two. Three-fifths take away two-fifths and of course the answer is one-fifth. Now you can see all of these have the same denominator so that's nice and easy. So you can go ahead and write down one to twenty and the answers to those fractions. So pause while you do that. The next bit is if you see a 1, and we've roughly touched on this in class, a 1, and you need to take a fraction away from a 1. What you need to do is look at the denominator of the other number, and of course, a 1, if it's fifths, means 5 over 5. That's how you would write a whole in a fraction, once you know the parts. So you just go 5 over 5, 5 take away 1 is 2, and the denominators are the same, so you leave it. So go ahead and do these ones. These are all easy. Five fifths take away four fifths. Well, of course, that's one fifth. So they've all got the same denominators, and that just gets you used to minusing with fractions. Now, for this whole number, take away four eighths. Remember, we're looking at the denominator in the fraction. So we go one, take away four eighths, and we convert that to eight eighths because there is the whole number on the bottom, take away 4, 8. So 8 take away 4 is 4, 4 over 8 is 8. Now, do we leave it like that? No, we simplify it. With how many 4s in 4, 1? How many 4s in 8, 2? It then becomes a half. So this one here would become 9 over 9. This one here would become 5 over 5, and so on. Now, when you get to the mixed fraction, what you've got to do is change this fraction into an improper fraction. And if we have a look here, it tells us, convert any whole numbers or mixed numbers into an irregular fraction. Copy the denominator from the question to the answer. It's important that the denominators do not change. Subtract the numerators like a regular subtraction. And then when you get an irregular fraction as the answer, you just convert it back to a mixed number. So here, you've got 1 and 8 tenths. Take away 9 tenths. So all you do is you go 10 times 1 is 10, plus 8 is 18 over 10. Take away 9 tenths. The denominator is the same. So 10 times 1 is 10, plus 8 is 18 over 10. Same denominator. Oops. And then take away 9 tenths. So straight away you use the same denominator. And 18 take away 9 is 9. So the answer is 9 tenths. That's for question 17. Let's do question 18. So we write it down. Question 18 is 1 and 3 fifths. Take away 4 fifths. So we convert that to an improper fraction. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 3 is 8 over 5. Take away 4 fifths. The denominators are the same. 8 take away 4 
is 4, 4 fifths. Can we simplify it? No, we just leave it like that. So go ahead and finish those 20 as well. So today's task for fractions, so make sure you understand the sheet we did above this. I'll just reduce that a little bit. Yep. Make sure you've understood how we've done this. Go back and play the video again if you're not sure. S subtracting with the um, same denominator is easy peasy. You just leave the denominator and do the subtraction on the numerator. Um, subtracting from a whole number, you just convert it to uh, 8 eighths or 9 ninths. You convert the 1. And for a mixed number, you turn a mixed number into an improper fraction and then take it away. And that is it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to do uncommon denominators and adding fractions. So that's it for maths today. So make sure you get all those mental maths, two from the six and seven from the minutes maths and four and five from the timed mental math book. What we're going to do now is look at science. And the first thing I'm going to show you about science today is a piece of work that Mr. Detrick sent. And the main concept of the science unit, which you remember from yesterday, is growing mould and how, how mould grows, the conditions that it grows. But what is physical and chemical change? So Mr. Dectrix has just written, a physical change, change includes changes in the size or shape of matter, and matter can be anything. Changes of state, for example, from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas. So we would have learnt that in grade two. So the matter that we're talking about there is water. So we can have water as a liquid, we freeze it, it becomes an ice, and then we heat it up so that it is boiling and it becomes steam. So in that way, there's three different changes to the matter that have occurred. Some of this process that causes physical change includes cutting, bending, dissolving, freezing, boiling and melting. A physical change is reversible. So if we take that steam and capture it in a container and then put it back into the freezer, we can freeze it back into a solid state. A chemical change is any change that causes a new substance to be formed. Ash is a new substance formed due to the burning of another substance wood. This is a chemical change. The roasting of marshmallows is also a chemical change. A chemical change is irreversible. So a physical change is, it can be reversed and changed back. A chemical change cannot be. So examples of chemical changes are butter melting, burning sugar, digesting food. So once you eat it, it goes into your stomach and acid breaks it down to a goo. Can't change back again. Ice cubes melting, so once they've melted, you have to put them in the freezer to turn back. Autumn leaves changing. Oh, so this is a list and you've got to tell us if it is a chemical change or a physical change, sorry. So up the top of your page, if you just write science and write physical and chemical changes and then one, butter melting. Butter melting, is it a physical change or a chemical change? Can we put melted butter back in the fridge and turn it back into butter? Chemical or physical? Burning sugar. So if you burn sugar and you make that liquid in a pan, if you, it cools down, does it turn back into sugar? Digesting food. I already gave you the hint to that one. Ice cubes melting. So if you take ice cubes that have melted, can you pour the water back into the ice cubes and refreeze it? Autumn leaves changing colour. Once they've actually changed colour, can they change back? Frying chicken, so a raw chicken, if you then put it in oil and fry it. A, nest, a nail rusting. Paper tearing, fog, fogging a mirror with your teeth and grating cheese. So if you can just write those down and write next to it if it's a physical or chemical change. That's your first little job for science today and you can pause me while you do that. The next thing I'm going to show you is we talked about mould and this is a change that's happening here to a tomato where it's decaying over time and mould's growing. 
So you can think about that as a physical or a chemical change as well. And I'm just going to play this um, slow motion. <laughs> substance okay the next thing I'm going to show you now is types of mold that there's all different types of mold that we um, grow so I'm going to let this fellow explain it to you not only are there different species of mold okay, I'll just take it. not only are there different species of mold but mold can be classified into four different categories which category the mold type is in is dependent on its water requirement the first category of mold would be the hydrophilic category. Mold species in this category require a lot of water and are usually found indoors where there may have been a significant amount of moisture. Such okay, so if you can write down types of mold at the top of your page. And the first one is hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water and philic means that they attract water. So hydrophilic. And just write down that definition of it. Re requires significant amount of water is usually found indoors. So this is this type of mold. Okay, pause that as long as you want. I'll just continue. As a bathroom or a basement. The second category is the mesophilic category. The mold in this category requires less moisture and can grow in average conditions where the relative humidity is between 30 to 50%. The third group is the zero tolerant category. Is the zero tolerant category. The, the third group uh, goes really quick, doesn't it? So just write that down. That's the second type, mesophilic, and it requires less amount of water and grows in average conditions. So that'd be an apple left in your bag. Where there wouldn't be much water. Between 30 to 50 percent. The third group is the zero tolerant category. The mold in this category grows in drier conditions where there is little humidity or moisture. And finally, there is the xerophilic category. The mold in there is the xerophilic category. Is that our third category? There we go. So zero, zero tolerant grows in drier conditions, little humidity or moisture. Finally, there is the xerophilic category. The mold in this category is rare and grows in very dry environments, such as the desert. Okay, so write that down. That's your fourth one, zero filling, and it grows in very dry environments like deserts. The mold in this category still needs moisture, but not nearly as much as the mold species in other categories. Well, no matter what mold you may be dealing with, you can get your home or office professionally tested and mold problem remediated by getting in touch with Mold Busters. Okay. For more information on our... That's a little bit of an ad there. So um, just write those different types of mold down. And if you want, you can Google those. Now, the next experiment that we're going to do that you can do at home, talking about chemical and physical changes, is to do with the reaction between yeast, which we find in bread and beer, um, and sugar. So when you add yeast to sugar, it really reacts. So um, this link is in the uh, daily schedule, but I'm going to play this for you just in case you, you um, can't copy that link. <laughs> Welcome to Sci Guys. I'm Ryan. And I'm Teresa. And today we're looking at fermentation with sugar and yeast. We'll be producing gas, and it won't be me this time. Bad job. 
This is a viewer requested episode. Thank you to this viewer for recommending this episode. Fermentation is a chemical breakdown of substances by bacteria, yeast, or other microorganisms, usually involving the production of gases and heat. The equipment and ingredients you're going to need for this episode includes multiple bottles, they can be glass or plastic, sugar, yeast, balloons, a funnel, measuring utensils, and warm water. We're not working with anything hazardous in this episode, but we still recommend gloves, goggles, and an apron or lab coat to protect from spills and splashes. The first step in our experiment is to add all your ingredients into the bottles. Using a funnel, add one package or two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. Now we're going to add the sugar. In the first bottle... Okay, so that yeast is just bread yeast and you can buy that from Coles or Woolies or anywhere and you just buy it in a box and it's about $1.50 and you get about four to eight packets. But we're not going to add any sugar. In the second bottle, we're going to add one teaspoon. In the third bottle, two teaspoons. In the fourth bottle, three teaspoons. Okay, so what you can do, um, little plastic bottles are fine. Um, water bottles are fine, little plastic ones. So the first bottle only had one teaspoon of yeast. They've all got one teaspoon of yeast and no sugar. So you could write that on the bottle. The second bottle has one teaspoon of sugar, sugar two teaspoons, and then three. So... The prediction would be that the greater amount of sugar, the greater the reaction with the yeast. All the conditions are the same, the same bottle, the same yeast. You're just adding the variable that you're changing is how much sugar you're putting in the bottles. With all your dry ingredients in the bottles, add one cup of warm water into each bottle. So it's the same amount of water bottle. With all the ingredients in your bottle, cover your bottle with your thumb or put the lid back on and give it a gentle mix. With all the ingredients in the bottle, put one balloon on each bottle spout and leave them somewhere warm to sit for an hour. Over the next hour or two, the balloons will gradually grow in size. After a few hours, you'll notice the balloon that was covering the bottle that had the most sugar in it grew to a larger size. So the hypothesis that you'd be asking here is why obviously there's a reaction with the uh, sugar and the yeast. The more is, is the reaction greater with the more amount of yeast and what is occurring with that reaction so that it is filling these balloons with gas because that's what's being produced from the reaction of the sugar and the yeast. Let's look at this experiment a little closer. Yeast is a fungus, and there are about 160 known species of yeast. Yeast is very small. One gram holds around 25 million cells, and has been used for thousands of years to help bread rise. But how does a fungus help bread rise? It has to do with what yeast eats, how they metabolize that food, and what waste products are released. Yeast feeds on sugars and starches. When the yeast consumes the sugar in our bottle, it breaks it down to be used as energy. But like all living beings, waste products are produced when metabolizing food. When the yeast metabolizes the sugar, the waste produced is carbon dioxide gas and ethanol. The carbon dioxide gas floats out of the liquid into the bottle, producing bubbles, and eventually floating up into the balloon. As the yeast consumes more sugar and produces more carbon dioxide, the pressure inside the bottle and balloon increases. This pressure presses on the walls of the balloon, causing it to expand and grow. The equation for this reaction looks like this. The reactant sugar, sucrose, is on the left, and the products, ethanol and carbon dioxide, are on the right. The bottles with greater amounts of sugar have more food for the yeast to consume, which results in larger amounts of carbon dioxide produced and a larger balloon on the top of the bottle. That's it for fermentation. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, consider supporting our next video by becoming Okay, so there you go and try that experiment at home. It's really, really easy and quick and send in your photos if you do it. Write down a little um, bit in your books about it. Um, just put in their uh, sugar and yeast experiment. Write down your prediction that we talked about earlier on and your actual observations of what happened and send me the photos. That'll be great. Okay, so the rest of the time, um, if we have a look at the schedule for today, that's all our lessons for today. As you can see, we're getting through them really, really quickly. Um, 
try and keep pace with them because if you fall behind, it's um, difficult to catch up. If you want to have a look at those links on your own, I've included them on the schedule, but of course you can always go back in this video. In the last part of the day, you should be um, sending me all your work so that I can give you feedback. If you've got any actual feedback you want to give me or any questions or concerns, can you please write it in the Teams in the chat a bit? It comes up with a little message that you've sent me a message anyway, so I'll see it, um, or put it on Dojo. Send in all your completed works. Try and send it in on Dojo Portfolio because then I can send it on to Mr Pike and Mrs Check to get extra stars and also keep a record of it on Dojo for me what you've actually done and you can use this extra time of your day to catch up with any outstanding work so if you didn't get around to watching the movie yesterday or you just didn't get everything finished at the end of the day that's a good time to catch up or whatever time of the day that suits your family i just wanted to point out i forgot to do a spell check here naughty me and that mold is spelled incorrectly here it's m-o-l-d-y so I should have checked that in here. I apologise for that. Just thought I'd point that out. Um, so have a really great day. Stay on top of your work. Send me everything so I can send you stars. Loving the work that you've sent me. You guys are doing a great job. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.